Give the Lord a shout of praise in this place this morning. Hallelujah. Rob, come and read that scripture right now. You may be seated. Okay, the pastor has asked me to read Colossians 2, 9, and 10. For in him, Jesus, lives all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Yes, amen. And you are complete in him, who is the head of all authority and power. Read 10 again. And you are complete in him. Amen. Who is the head of all authority and power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, give the Lord a shout. Yes, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Rob. All right, we'll go there. All right. Got your Bibles with you? Now, I want to get this morning to, God wants us to get to 2 Peter chapter 3, but first we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And Father, we thank you. We praise you. And this, what we're about to read out of your word, is our prayer this morning. That you give us, through the word this morning, wisdom and revelation, that we have the knowledge of you, that we have the knowledge of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and in all that, our eyes are enlightened and open to an understanding to everything you have called us to. And we thank you for it. We praise you for it this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16. Paul says this, and this is my sentiment this morning towards you. I cease not to give thanks for you, for every one of you, making mention of you in my prayers. And here's the prayer, that God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you, every one of you, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of revelation, in the knowledge of of him the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation resides in the knowledge of who God the father of glory is and all of that is Jesus Christ the eyes of your understanding being enlightened or opened that you may know that you may have a light shined on what is the hope of God's calling. What has God called us to? Every promise that God has given in his word is a calling. Every commandment in God's word is a calling. Every word in this book that we read and we hear from God is meant to transform our life. Every calling that God has placed here is meant to transform our life. When Hilton Sutton was here, and, and not only when he was here, I heard this a lot from him when he was here on earth. If you want the truth, how many of you want the truth? Amen. Then read your Bible. Amen? So we want the truth this morning. Amen? I'm looking at a congregation this morning in this place. And God said when I'd get here, I would see this place full with 180 people. And I see it. And there's 180 people here this morning that I absolutely refuse to have anyone miss a coming event that God has planned for the church. And that is the rapture. Or as the Bible puts it, the day of the Lord. A lot of people say, well, the rapture, that's, that word's not in the Bible. There isn't going to be a rapture. We'll get to that in a minute here. There will be a rapture. Amen. And it's called the day of the Lord. Now, turn your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3. 
And as I said, I want to get we got, want to get God wants us to get to 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 10 this morning. But we're going to start in verse 1 of chapter 3. Everybody there? Shout amen. amen. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. In other words, Peter's saying, I'm not going to tell you anything new, but I'm going to stir up your minds of things you have already got inside you to bring it to a remembrance. And he starts out this book, this, this second Peter, he starts out here, he said, look, I'm going to talk to those of you who have obtained like precious faith, who have gotten the righteousness of God. I want you to know, Peter says, grace and peace is being multiplied to you. Poke your neighbor and tell him, grace and peace is being multiplied to me. Come on. Now try it again and say it like you mean it. Mm -hmm. Well now, Brother Jerry, you just don't know what's going on in my life right now. Well, to an extent, but I know what's going on in mine. And I'm telling you this morning, I am claiming the grace and the peace of God being multiplied unto me this morning. Amen. Amen. He says to take, I, I'm going to stir up your minds and tell you to add to your faith or build your faith, bring structure and substance to your faith. All right. So he says, I, I'm going to stir your mind up in all this stuff in remembrance so that you, we're back to chapter 3, verse 1, that you may be mindful of the words. Of the words. Now the Holy Spirit is poking me right now, and I'm going to say this. Even during this message, these altars are open. If you're led of God this morning to come up here and steal that song that, that Nelson played, I asked him to play a song, and I, he, that was a different song than I asked you to play. But that was the song God wanted. Amen. To take our brokenness and put it at the altar. And if you haven't got rid of that this morning and God is poking at you, stop being worried about what somebody else is thinking you come up here even during the message and get down here to this altar and put that brokenness on the altar and I'm going to tell you what, you're going to walk out of here a different person. Amen. There's things in our lives right now that Satan has broken that is trying to, to keep us in a hold in his grip to keep us from the grace and the peace of God. And Peter is saying, I'm stirring you up. I'm going to stir your mind this morning is what Peter's saying. Well, that's God talking through Peter. Amen? Rose, come up here. Rose had something happen to her this week. Actually, yesterday, correct? Friday, was it? Well, Saturday. That was yesterday, Rose. Today, Sunday. Go ahead. I went to work yesterday, and actually, you know, I've been having a lot of trouble with all the workers there because there's things going on, which no concern of yours. But anyway, finally, I got on my radio, and I called on the radio, and I said to everyone that has a radio on, please come back to Hall 10. I would like to talk to you, which is my workers. And after they got back there, we went into the little room, and I said, I just want to say I'm tired of all the bickering, backbiting, all this stuff. And I said, we need to help each other and stop all this fighting. And when I was done, <laughs> then I pulled out my Bible. <laughs> and I read some scriptures while they were all standing there. And after I read it, I, I may have gave a little sermon, not too much. But I asked them, I said, anybody here want to be yes, saved? Sir. I said, because if you do, come on right up here with me. And at first I didn't think anybody was going to move, but then there was a guy that said, well, I need Jesus. I said, come on up. And there was another one. So I had two, and then, you know, and I know it was the Holy Spirit doing this through me. And the, there was another person, and I said, I think there's one more. 
which it was. And so we all stood up here and we, you know, got them saved, said the, what we should have said, and, and then I had little testaments that I keep at work and I gave them the New Testament. But the point is, is it wasn't me, it was the Holy Spirit, but I realized that I'm bolder now. I want to make sure people are saved. Amen. And so, and I told the rest of them, you know, I said, if you ever want to, you decide you want to see me, I will help you. Amen. And I invited them to church, but some of them have churches they go to. But for me, that was a big, big step of faith. But I'm really happy about it. (laughs) (laughs) Give the Lord a shout. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, that's what Peter's talking about right here, is stirring our mind. God stirred Rose's mind yesterday towards an evangelistic effort in a place where she works. We got to be open. We got to be ready to that word. All right. And he said, for what purpose? So that we would be mindful or full of the mind of his words, which were spoken before Yes, sir. I'm getting ahead of myself. God has spoke to us, all of us, through his word. Amen? Um, God gave me a vision, a word, on January 1st of this year, of the three waves. Talked about that. I preached that. Uh, If you want to get a copy of that, I think Larry can get you a copy of it on a CD so you can hear it again. But after that happened... On the 8th of January, I was in prayer in the morning, as I always am. And God said to me, oh, I like this. What do you desire for 2019? What do you desire for 2019? And he said, what do you desire for the ministry and for your home? So I started to write some things down. And here's my desire for this ministry for 2019. I desire that every person that walks through those doors is healed from sickness and disease. Every one of them. I desire that every person in this place, all 180 of you this morning, are delivered from lack and poverty, that it's destroyed over your households. I desire that our eyes be enlightened to the truth of God's word. And I desire that faith grows out of love and that we become the fullness of Jesus Christ in Licking County. I wrote all those down. And God said then, he says, okay, what do you desire for your home? I said, God, I want my home to be a place of refuge, love, and faith in you and in your word. That no matter who comes into our home, comes in there and knows it's a place of safety and it's a place of refuge away from the things of the world. I said, God, I want and I desire Psalm 133 unity to come fully to my home. And I said, God, I desire that the finances of my home flow on a constant basis without interruption. And I sat back, I had wrote these down, and God said to me, now, this is your vision, this is your calling for 2019, and it will be fulfilled through those three waves in the vision I gave you. Now work the waves to fulfill the vision. Okay. 2014, 2015, and 2016, Gary Wood was with us, and he preached a continuous message in those three years about what God wanted and expected from this ministry. We, of course, at that point, from January 8th, went to the minister's conference, and my, 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 let me just ask Rose and Lynn, I know we came back pretty full. 
Amen? Very full. Well, just this week on Monday, I was praying for God's wisdom to pull down the strongholds over my life, over the ministry, and over Lincoln County. 2 Corinthians 10, 4. All right. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through the, for the pulling down of strongholds. And so I'm praying, and I thought, okay, God, I want to know the strongholds over my life, over this ministry, and over Licking County. And God said, are you ready for that? I said, yes, I want to know them. I want to pull them down. Because if we don't know the strongholds, we can't pull them down. Okay? If Satan's got our eyes blinded to those strongholds, we, we just don't see them and we don't do anything with them. I said, God, give it to me straight. And I am going to open myself up to you right now. Excuse me. I didn't want to do this this morning. And then I heard her testimony and I thought, Wow. Something's happening here. God told me, he said, here's the strongholds over your life. You're lacking confidence. You need more confidence. Well, what he was telling me was I need more faith. He said, you've got sickness in your body and it shouldn't be there. And he said, you're lacking in the financial area. Those are strongholds right now over my life, and because I haven't had the confidence or the faith where it should be in, the, uh, in getting rid of the sickness and the, and the lack of finances, that's what's caused those two, is the lack of confidence or the faith that I need. Okay? I got to go back and pull these strongholds down. I said, okay, then what's those strongholds over the ministry? <laughs> the lack of confidence to fulfill the calling that I've placed on this ministry. The lack of finances. And I'm not pressing for you to give more. I'm talking to you what God told me. And he said, you need an increase in my wisdom. And that increase needs to be in the entire body of believers here at Oasis. Now he showed me that the lack of the confidence in the, in the calling of God, the, the entire calling of God in this ministry is, is to become the apostle to Licking County. And he told me, he said, that doesn't mean I've taken away the call of the prophet that I originally put on your life. That will always be there. And he said, in the meantime, he says, you also need to know that I have given you the anointing to pastor this flock. Okay, we've got some strongholds we've got to pull down to produce the ministry here. And then I said, okay, God, what are the strongholds over Licking County? And he gave me, he said, I'm going to give you three of them, and they're all caused by one thing. He said, drugs and alcohol are predominant in this county, and he says, even in my ministry. There are ministers out there trying to bury themselves in drugs and alcohol instead of the word of God to set them free. He said, the cares of the world are pressing in to keep my word from being preached. He said, there is anger, hatred, bitterness at a very extremely high level in this county. And he said, here's the reason. Religion, false doctrine. False doctrine has become a stronghold over this county. And he said, because of that, my church is weak and void of power. Now we could probably say that for a good portion of the United States, but we live here. All right? Now what is God trying to do here? He wasn't trying to condemn me in anything that was wrong in my life or the ministry or the county. 
What he's trying to do is what Peter's talking about right here is stir up our minds this morning. Okay, we now know and recognize the strongholds that Satan has pride to put in our life and we can take a hold of those strongholds with the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Word and we can pull them down and crush them under our feet. Amen? So Peter says, I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. And I sat back, I thought about that, and Lynn and I were, we were coming back from someplace the other day. And I, and I made this comment about a person in a certain position. And I said, you know, they got to have a certain arrogance to be in that position, very high level position. And she stopped and she, drive, she was driving. And she, just, she says, you know what? I really don't think it's arrogance, it's confidence. She said, we need to know the difference between the confidence and the arrogance. And we spent the time, the rest of the time going home talking about the confidence over arrogance. Arrogance a lot of times is a person trying to cover a lack of confidence. Hmm? Trying to be what, what that song said, trying to be something we're not. Instead of letting God make us something we should be. Confidence is knowing that when I speak the word of God, it gets all of us. Heaven's attention. When I speak the word of God, it not only gives, gets all of the heaven's attention, it gets hell's attention. Amen. Because they look and say, hey, uh-oh, we're going to confront Jesus again. And it brings to their remembrance 2,000 years ago when he, they thought they had him and he was laying dead in that hell mess, and all of a sudden, they're looking, and they're cheering, and they're clapping, but now he gets up. He rises up in the middle of them, and they're saying, he can't do this. Yes, he did. And then he took their leader and made a show of him openly right there in the pit of hell. Then he rose up, stopped that paradise, and said, come on, guys, let's go. And there was a rapture out of hell. Amen. That's confidence over arrogance. Confidence is knowing who we are in Christ. Now watch this. Whew, glory. Whew. How many hours you got this morning? Knowing... This first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Now let me stop there. And let me just put it this way. Where's the promise? Folks, Peter's writing this letter to people who have obtained like Precious faith. Amen? And yet, there are scoffers in that group. It's something we would expect the world to say. Where's the promise? Where's the promise of his healing? Where's the promise of financial prosperity? Where's the promise of his grace and his mercy and all of this stuff? And all that we see going on around here in the church is preached. Well, you know, God is responsible for it all and he did all this stuff. I'm going to shout this about as loud as I can get. He is not responsible for the mess of this earth. Amen. But he has taken the responsibility to clean it up. And he did it through Jesus Christ. And until we accept Jesus Christ, then we can't clean up our lives. Like that minister told me when I walked into the church on a Sunday night, drunk from drinking whiskey, me and my friend. And he looked at me and told me to leave the church till I got cleaned up. We walked out of there and looked at each other. How do we do that? 
That's what we came there that night. I don't want to see anybody else have that happen. I don't want to see another church where, I don't want to see this church where somebody walks in those doors and said, I need to be cleaned up, and we tell them to go back out until they do. Amen. We help them get cleaned up right here. Amen. The drug addicts, the alcoholics, the prostitutes, the sick, the lame, the halt, the blind. We're here to help them. Amen? And even those who come in that have been sitting in church and are coming to find the truth, we need to help them. Amen? That's what we're here for. Scoffers. We'll take a moment, turn over to Revelation chapter 1. It's all right this morning. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and listen to this, the prince of the kings of the earth. God takes his princely ministry of Jesus and puts it over kings. Now, we've heard this, and it's been preached. The heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord. Okay? You ever heard that? The heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord. But wait a minute. What kings? What kings? See, we've taken in our countries, and whether we use the term kings or president or potentate or whatever, you know, they're calling them, not every person who has been placed in that position has been placed there by God. Anybody ever read 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles? A whole lot of kings in there. There's only two good ones out of the whole bunch. So I ask you, which one of those had their heart in the hands of God? Let me give you an example. And I really believe this is where the country started to turn. In the early 60s, you, could all, you, you couldn't really, there wasn't a whole lot of difference between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. There really wasn't. But then an event happened. A, a man who, he, he had some personal problems, yes, but boy, he was a good president. John F. Kennedy. Amen. Powerful man. I, I don't know how much attention he had with God, but he was a powerful man to run this country. He got shot, killed. He was assassinated. And the man who was behind him, Lyndon Baines Johnson, was made president automatically because he was vice president. And then the country voted him in again. God did not have that man's heart in his hands. That's the man who in the 50s, it's called the Johnson Law, who said the church has no business in the government. But the government has business in the church. That's the context of that law. It's not right. That's not our Constitution. Amen. What the Constitution was saying under, the, under, that, uh, under the, that amendment was the fact that the government had no business in the church, but the church had business in the government. And it changed the demographics of the two parties, and it changed the demographics of this country. One of the first things our current president did was to appeal the Johnson Law. Hallelujah. Somebody shout praise the Lord. That man's heart is in the hands of God, and we better know it, and we better believe it. Amen? We have three nations on this earth. That's it. The United States isn't a nation in the eyes of God and so on. We have three nations. One is Israel, the Jewish people. Two is the body of Christ, the church, wherever they are across the world. And number three are the Gentiles, those that don't know God. God had placed himself as king over Israel. 
And Israel kept yelling, we want to be like everybody else. We want a king. We want a king like everybody else. And God's telling them, you got one. <laughs> but we want what we want. And God says, well, I'll give you the desire of your hearts. Hello. They got it. I have to ask a question. Has the church gone the way of Israel and said, God, you're not good enough as our king? Just need to leave that hang out there a while. Because listen to this. Are you ready for this? Unto him that loved us, that's Jesus Christ, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. How many believe that? Amen. then you got to believe this and the same one who loved us has made us kings and priests Amen. Amen. unto God and his father we're made kings and priests in his kingdom and it's the kingdom of God that should be ruling this earth did you get anything right there To him, to God, to the Father, be glory and dominion forever and how long? Ever. Amen. That means so be it, it's settled. This is settled, folks. One of the things in those three years that Gary came over those three weekends, one of the messages he brought was we are kings. In the kingdom of God. If you want more on that, I would recommend Bill Winston has a whole series out on us being kings. Outstanding. Back to 2 Peter chapter 3. That was a little sidebar. Verse 4. They're saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. In other words, <laughs> everything was a mess then, it's a mess now. Now listen, are, are your ears open this morning? Yes. Your heart's open this morning? Yes. All right. Got your eyes open this morning. <laughs> For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of. He's about to tell us something that the church has willingly been ignorant to. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Now let me take care of some doctrine here. He is not talking about the flood that came during Noah's time. Because the earth did not perish during Noah's time. He's talking about the Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 account. Amen. I'm not going to go into that right now. There are some very good studies out there. I know I did some... I don't remember whether we did that. I know we did it on a Wednesday night. We went through quite a bit of that. I don't know that I've ever preached it. But uh, probably the best I've heard on that, it's a two-part series by Charles Capps on the world that was. Uh, Perry Stone has something out on that that's pretty good, and so does Billy Brim. So if you're looking for that and you want to do that, you want to get into that before God leads me to do it, uh, I know we've, I've got, we've got those in our library. Uh, if you need them, Larry's pointing at me. You've got a copy of that. So he'll, he'll be glad to make you a copy of it if you need that. So let me go on from there. Verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, shout now, now. by the same word, the same word, that took the chaotic situation that was there in Genesis 1-2 is the same word that is holding or keeping in store and reserving this earth that's now unto the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of godly men. It's God's word that is holding this all together. 
The perdition of ungodly men means the loss, the ruin, the total destruction. God is saying, my word is not going to allow ungodly men to bring a total destruction to this until I get what I want out of this. Come on, somebody catch what he's saying this morning. God's not done. And those ungodly people who are following Satan out there are not going to get their day. Oh, they're going to get their day, but not the day that they expect. You still here? Don't go home yet. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the Lord and a thousand, as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. You know, there's, there's a lot of people who have made a full doctrine out of that. This pertains to what we're about to hear right here. Now, there are other places where it pertains, but you've got to sort that stuff out. That's rightly dividing words of truth. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some man counts slackness, but his long-suffering, shout praise the Lord, praise to usward, who are not, he is not willing that any should parents perish, but that all should come to repentance. But, uh-oh, we got a but here. The day of the Lord will Come. He's not slack in that promise. The day of the Lord will come. And it's going to come as a thief in the night. Now, I'm going to say something and go quickly through that. We'll get into this deeper as we go into this study. He is not coming as a thief in the night to the body of Christ. He's coming as a thief in the night to the other two nations but not the body of Christ. God said, we know the time, we know the season. We'll get into that. In the which, now listen to this, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Now the heavens, though there's three heavens, but only two of these will be affected with this. Shall pass away with great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. How many of you want to be here when that happens? Thank you. Okay. As, as just Josh said, it's going to get hot. This is all part of the day of the Lord, folks. Verse 10 covers a 1,000 year period. All right. And we'll show you this. It covers the rapture. It covers the tribulation period, the millennial reign of Christ, and it covers the release of Satan again. Satan will be unbound and released again into the earth. All right? We'll, we'll get to all that. I'm just wetting your appetite. We're just introducing this this morning. Can you imagine what the rest is going to be like? Verse 11. Are you all there? Everybody there? You got your Bible there? Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conversation and godliness? I think I need to read that again. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conversation and godliness? Looking and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, which is the day of the Lord, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we know that's coming. All right? God's not slack in his promises. All right, we know that's coming. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, we've got something else to look for. 
we look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein will dwell nothing but righteousness. God's about to turn this thing around and get it to where he wanted it in the first place. <clears throat> Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him, of Jesus Christ, in what? Peace. Romans 5, 2 says that we are at peace with God. In other words, we talked about this last week. There's nothing missing or nothing broken in our relationship with God. Without spot and blameless. Jesus is coming back for a church without spot or without wrinkle. And let me tell you something, he's going to find it. We got to get our eyes off the world. And quite frankly, we got to get our eyes off the religious church. Amen? And get our eyes on the church, the true church of God and of Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter what the name is out on the front. It's what's going on inside. Let me finish this up. My goodness. Go to Revelation chapter 4. Now, if my math is correct... Revelation 4 follows chapters 1, 2, 3. Am I correct on that? All right. Revelation 2 and 3, well, Revelation 1 is an introduction to us on who Jesus Christ is. He's the faithful. He's the firstborn. He's the alpha. He's the omega. He's the beginning. He's the end. He's the one who stands in the midst of the candlesticks with the church led by the Holy Spirit. But then John gets this and he's told to send these letters and the termination, the terminology here is send them to the angels of the church. The angels there is messengers. He's really saying send them to the messengers of the church, which are the pastors. Amen. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. He's saying send that to the fivefold ministry. And he goes through seven elements of seven various churches that existed at that time. And let me tell you something, they still exist today. And as we look through there, we can identify ourselves and where we're at. God identified us with the Philadelphia church. We got to love. I don't know how many times Lynn and I have been told people walking out the door, we're not going to be here anymore because you don't walk in love. I don't know what they expect. But I'll tell you what. I'm not going to pat you on the back and tell you everything's all right when it's not. And that is love. Amen? And sometimes, <laughs> if you get my terminology here, when you got to help somebody pull themselves up by the bootstraps, <laughs> it don't feel good. <laughs> but we all need help. Amen? So he's going through all these, and God told us, we've been weak from fighting the battles, but folks... I'm going to tell you something. It's about time we won. Amen? Now watch this. Now we get to chapter 4. After this, I looked, and behold, a door opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. Underline those words in your Bible. Come up hither. What's he saying? John is saying when the church listens to the message from Jesus Christ and we start putting ourselves in the position that he's called us to, we will hear the trumpet and the trumpet will say this, Get up here! And then he tells John, and he's telling us right now, and I will show you things 
which must be hereafter. From there on, we hear about the day of the Lord that Peter was talking about. And we're going to go into that. We're going to get into a lot of this on what we need to do, what we need to accomplish for God, and the life that we ought to be living for Him. Stand on your feet, because if I look at the next line in my outline, we'll be here another hour. <laughs> Would somebody give the Lord a shout of praise this morning? <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, we're just getting warmed up on this. Uh, if, we stay on, if we stay on track and God keeps going here next week, we're going to talk about the hope of the gospel. Folks, there's got to be hope before there can be faith. Yeah. Amen. Lynn, come on. In. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Did you get anything out of this this morning? I... Uh, when, when we went to the minister's conference, we stopped uh, to talk to... Uh, Annie Grace, who is Dennis Burke's uh, executive secretary, and she runs the book table at the minister's conference, and so I've gotten to know her through the years. And I noticed a little book sitting there that Dennis wrote. It was the first book he wrote, How to Meditate on the Word. And I went and got a couple. I think, Rosa, did I give you one of those? I think I did. I started reading that book again. hadn't read it in a while. Wow. And when I finished reading it, God told me, he said, now go over and read my son Copeland's words on that. And I did, and I put them together. And I have really been deeply meditating on the Word of God. And folks, it's working. And it'll work the same for you. If you need those books, we can get some from, as a matter of fact, I may just order some and get several here. Get them in your hands. We want every tool of the gospel we can get in our hands. Amen. Father, we thank you this morning. We praise you. We praise you, Holy Spirit, for what you've put in our hearts today. Oh, I thank you that this word has pen penetrated every heart in this place. And that, Father, as we have your commandments and we keep them, we shall grow, we shall profit in all areas of our life. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Now, I loose the angels of glory to build a blessing wall, a hedge around every vehicle out there. We go down the road without incident. We arrive safely to our destinations. And Father, I'm asking you to give everyone in this place a total peace and comfort today. May we enjoy the day with our Lord. May we enjoy the day with each other. Father, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we thank you. God bless you this morning.